We've been talking about resurrection for the past three weeks because there is a move within uh, Christianity um, to question the act of resurrection as to whether or not it was theologically possible and historically accurate. It is. Amen. I'm finished. <laughs> I'm done, okay. It is. Let's, let's get it over. Uh, resurrection. Let's talk about resurrection. Of course, we show this picture because this is the eastern gate. This is the gate that Jesus will enter. And a lot of people say, uh, you know, the Muslims brick this up so that the Messiah wouldn't enter through this gate. Uh, can I just tell you, bricks ain't no big deal to God. And I want to remind you one thing archaeologically. Are you ready? That's not the gate of Jesus this time. There's a gate underneath it. It ain't bricked up. <laughs> and the Bible says there will be a great earthquake that splits the uh, Mount of Olives to the north and to the south. Guess what? We're on the east. That means there's going to be a rift that opens that gate right open. And that first century gate will be open. It is not bricked up. So it's going to be easy for him to do. If we looked at the Old Testament. And what the Old Testament says about resurrection, uh, we looked at the New Testament, and we looked at the, the Jewish writings of the first century, the biblical tractate, that uh, talks about uh, resurrection. Um, we looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 about the last resurrection, about, about the rapture, about when Jesus comes back uh, to rescue and to uh, take his own, that there will be a resurrection there. We looked at uh, the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15 and did an entire week's study telling us that, folks, it is not a big surprise when the rapture is going to happen. It's not. Now, no man knows the day or the year. We don't know what year it is, but we do know the season. And the season is, of course, that Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. Because the very last trumpet blast of 100 blasts in the Greek and the Hebrew both are called the Tekayango de la which means the last trump. The last trump. So when Paul was speaking about the last trump of God, every Jew knew what he was talking about. That it would be on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I don't know what year the Feast of Trumpets is going to happen, but I do know when the Feast of Trumpets come around, I get happy. I get happy because it could be today. It could be that moment. It could be that time. Okay? And that's what Scripture says. Last week we looked at examples of resurrection in the Old Testament. And this week, we're going to look at resurrections in the Gospels, okay? So, get out your Bibles, let's take a look at Luke 7. Luke 7, the 11th verse. Luke 7, verse 11. It says, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Amen? Amen. And so in Luke 7, we have uh, the story of the Nain widow son, the widow from Nain. Mark the fifth chapter, Mark 5. Mark 5, verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came to the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? This child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was, taking the child by the hand he said to her, said to her, Talitha come, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and said that something should be given her to eat. And so in Mark 5, we have the story of Jairus' daughter, 
the synagogue official, probably in the city of Capernaum. Probably it does not say, but probably in the city of Capernaum, which you can visit that synagogue yet today. That day has been excavated. The synagogue of the time of Christ has been excavated there. John 11. John 11, verse 40. John 11, verse 40 says, Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. And so here in John, we have the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. So we have the widow from Nain's son. We have Jairus' daughter. We have Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, one of his dear friends, who was raised with him. And then, of course, we can't forget Jesus himself. One of the resurrections in the New Testament. Amen? And so we have here four in the New Testament who were raised from the dead. No doubt about it. If we look at the New Testament and the resurrection, look at Acts 9. Acts 9. Acts 9, verse 40. Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Amen? Here we have Tabitha, or her name is Dorcas, who was raised by Peter. Acts, the 20th chapter. Acts 20, verse 9. For some reason, people have linked me with this verse a lot. I'm not sure why. But it says there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep while Steve talked. <laughs> Wait, is that what it says? Yeah. Paul was a little long-winded, I guess, okay? But anyway, Eutychus is sinking into a deep sleep, and as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. dead. Yeah, dead. Eutychus is dead. <laughs> Go to church and die. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he'd gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak, and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Amen. Now, see, you can come to Wednesday night church and still leave alive. I'm still, still come out alive. Eutychus, raised from the dead in the book of Acts. The Gospel and the Resurrection, we would be remiss if we did not look at Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Again, it's one thing for someone to stand up front and give a lecture about what happens in the Bible, what happens, but it's one thing to read it. To read it for yourself. Matthew 27, let's begin in the 50th verse, verse 50. Matthew 27, 50 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly. This is the Son of God. And so we have a story of not only individuals being raised from the dead, but on this particular day, we see the saints in Jerusalem. The saints of Jerusalem. I do not believe that these are Old Testament saints. I personally believe that these are uh, believers of the day who had passed away, those who had fallen and, and passed away, uh, because they were recognized by the people in town. People would recognize Isaiah and Ezekiel if they got up. Okay? And they're saved for the last days anyway. Now remember, when we talk about resurrection, this is not eternal resurrection. These people all died again. Mm -hmm. They all died a second time. But they were given more life and more chance in a longer period. This is not the eternal resurrection. 
But when we talk about this particular resurrection, we are talking about what I believe are the first fruits. The t festival of first fruits is one of the celebrations of the Jews. They have the spring holidays, Passover, that's when Jesus was tried, unleavened bread when he was crucified, and first fruits when he rose again. This is the holiday of the Jews that has been celebrated for thousands of years. And yet on this particular year, in 33 A.D., give or take a year, in 33 A.D., Jesus himself was tried and found to be pure. There's three days of testing that happens for a lamb before it can be slaughtered on Passover. The lamb of the, of the nation of Israel must be kept for three days and examined by the priest to be found spotless and pure. Jesus was tried between, by three different councils. He was tried by three different groups of people and found to be spotless. I find no sin in him. So as the lamb was being checked in the temple, Jesus was being checked. And as that lamb was being taken at the third hour of the day and was being slaughtered on the altar, Jesus himself is on the cross and he is bleeding for the sins of the world. And then that lamb is put onto the fire and is roasted and burned as a burnt offering. And Jesus was laid in the grave. We know that in the first fruits, three days later, that the priest would go out to the temple field and he would take up the first sprouts of growth from the wheat harvest. The barley harvest had already come in and weeks later that wheat harvest is going to come. And they scoop out of the ground and they proclaim... This is the first fruits that comes from the inner bowels or from the depth of the earth. At the same time that the priest was in the temple field, scooping up that grain and scooping up that little sprout, the earth began to shake. And there was an earthquake. And then that earthquake, the, roll, the stone was rolled away. And Jesus, the first fruit, the first resurrected, the first one to come out of the ground, came forth in glory. But guess what? He wasn't the only one that day. He was the first fruit to come forth. The rest of them all came out on that celebration, and there was a resurrection of more than just one, because it was a symbol of the fact that because Jesus lives, we will too. Amen. That he's the first to be resurrected, but he's not the last to be resurrected. Amen. He is the first fruits, and it happened on the day of first fruits. Look at Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 23. The Sadducees. The Sadducees followed the first five books only. The Pharisees followed all the other books, and that's where their problems came up. They argued with one another. Because one of them believed only in the first five books, and the others believed in the rest of the books. The Sadducees were the temple priests. And so they all followed just the first five books. The Pharisees were teachers outside the temple, but temple priests were all Sadducees. They had a, a chokehold on the temple. Leviticus 23, the 10th verse says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you, and when you reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day of the Sabbath, the priest will wave it. And so clear back before there was a tabernacle, before there was a holy land, before there was an Israel, before in the midst of their wandering, God already ordained a first fruit. Folks, this is symbolic of the fact that as they were wandering in the wilderness, God was letting them know that there's going to be a resurrection someday that we will all come out of the ground as the first fruit. And so clear back in Leviticus 23, the first fruits have been ordained. And now every year, every year, every year, every year, they celebrate the first fruits. Go to the New Testament and see how this plays out. Let's see how this ends up. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, the 20th verse. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. 
Here, Paul actually calls Jesus the first fruit. He is the first to be resurrected. He draws this symbol, going clear back to Leviticus 23, and says, remember when God told us to do this in the wilderness? It was all about Jesus. It was all about Christ. It was pointing towards. It was a symbol of the reality that was to come. Here's the, here's the cartoon drawing, and here's the reality. Here's the, here's the coloring book, and here's the truth. The truth is that Jesus was, always, has been, and forever will be, the first fruits of the resurrection. And because he lives, we will too, he said. So he is the first fruits, no doubt about it, that this is a celebration of that particular day. And isn't it a coincidence? Isn't it a coincidence? We don't believe in coincidences, do we? Not when God's in control. But isn't it a coincidence that he would actually be raised from the dead on the day of first fruits? Three days after the Passover. My goodness, it's almost like somebody planned it that way. Mm, what do you think? Almost like somebody planned it that way. God's ways are higher than our ways. We can never, never out guess God. But the good news is that because there's a first fruit, there's going to be a second fruit, and a third fruit, and a fourth fruit, and a millionth fruit, and a ten millionth fruit, and a hundred millionth fruit, that we are the first fruits and we will be resurrected with Him. Do you realize that there are more Christians walking on the planet at this minute, more born-again believing Christians, not people just attend church, not people just give their tithes, not people just sit in the pews, but there are more Bible-believing, born-again saints on planet Earth today than all previous history put together. The world was rather small in the beginning, and the gospel was even smaller. But it's been estimated that right at this moment, if we took all of the Bible-believing Christians, we would have more right now than all previous history. Folks, heaven's not going to be all that big. It's not going to be all that big. And Jesus tried to let us know that when he said that there's two gates. One of them is really wide and broad and easy to get into. But my gate is narrow. And only those who enter through me will be entered into the gate. See, a lot of people think because they were born in a church, they're Christian. Like being born in a bakery makes you a donut. It just doesn't. Those who are going to be raised in the last day are those who have exchanged their life, their will, and their wishes for the life, will, and wishes of Christ. We must die to be raised again. Now the Bible is very clear that not all of us are going to die physically before the resurrection. Right? We looked at that last week. 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians says that not all, not all of us are going to be raised to sleep. We're going to be walking around and the rapture is going to happen. Some of us are going to be raised without being dead. You can't be resurrected without first being dead. Believers are dead to Christ. They are dead to their sin. They're dead to their past. They have laid down all that they have on this earth and said, take what I have, I'll take what you have. You see, we've already died. We died to ourselves. The only people who will be resurrected in the end are those who have been on a cross and been declared dead. Because he did. We will too. But there's still going to be a hell. And hell's going to be full. Because just because Jesus died on the cross, it's not an automatic stamp on a year ticket. You must make your salvation personal. You must accept the gift personally. And what is the gift? I die to me. Not I embrace your thoughts, I embrace your teaching, I embrace your thinking, I embrace your gospel, I embrace your word, I embrace your philosophy. Jesus is not a philosophy. Jesus is the first fruits of many. We must die. D. I, E, to self. Galatians tells us in the second chapter, for I, Stephen Clare, have been crucified with Christ. And the 
It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in and through me. I have died to the desires of Steve, and I have come awake and alive. And now he lives in and through me. So two holidays are celebrated here. We have the first fruits when we're resurrected. And when will that happen? I believe it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets. And the last trump of God is sounded. It's a promise. It's a hope. I've said before, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, you see the word hope. If it doesn't refer to an immediate hope, like I hope my son's okay, I hope the army comes. If it's not an immediate reference to the word of immediacy of hope, every time the word hope is used in the Old and New Testament, it directly refers to resurrection. Because you see, without the resurrection, we have no hope. The Jews hoped in the day when the Messiah would come and make resurrection they knew it wasn't possible under the law, but it would be under the Messiah. Well, guess what, boys and girls? The Messiah has come. Amen. We're on this side of the Messiah. And we have that firm and sure hope. If, if, one more, if we're in Christ. So the first fruits and the trumpets are ours to celebrate. Let's stand together. Let's pray.